Hi there, I'm the Mythkeeper. Welcome back to my channel. This week we're going back to my creature feature series and I'm finally tackling that video that everyone's been requesting in the comments. I'm talking about dragons today. As soon as I did my very first creature feature on giants, my comments were full of people requesting dragons and every single subsequent creature feature I've gotten those comments as well. I promised that I would get to it, so here we are. Last week I did a deep dive on Northeast Avistan in that nation. Uh, Carl the Conqueror uh, conquered a huge nation. He himself was reputed to be a red dragon. There's also a bunch of dragons uh, that live in Ayobaria as well. So since I talked a lot about dragons in my last region deep dive, I thought now is finally the place to talk about dragons in my creature feature. I think this is a fun video. I hope you all enjoy it. Dragons are a fascinating creature type from a mythological standpoint. For a start, unlike giants, hags, or fey, some of the other creature types I've covered in my creature feature series, it isn't immediately clear how ancient people came to the idea of giant flying reptiles. The conceptual starting point, however, seems to have been the serpent, or at least that's how the word seems to originate etymologically in the English language. The word dragon entered the English language in the early 13th century from the ancient Greek, dracon, meaning a great or mighty serpent. The Greeks and Romans used the term dracon to refer to both mythological serpentine species, such as the hydra, as well as using it for very large non-mythical serpents as well. The Greek word itself was a derivation of the word drekomai, which meant to see. In Greek terms, this word literally meant that which sees, something that only makes sense if you consider a snake's eyes appear to be always open. Each eye actually sees through the transparent membrane of its eyelids, which stay permanently shut. The word dragon has also come to be applied to the legendary creatures in Chinese mythology called the Long. Archaeologist Zhu Zhongfa believes that the Chinese word for dragon is an onomatopoeia of the sound of thunder, which is lung in Cantonese. In Chinese mythology, dragons are typically depicted as long serpentine creatures with scales, claws, and the ability to breathe fire. They are often associated with water, and in some legends are said to live in lakes and rivers. But dragons are, of course, not limited to just Greek and Chinese mythology. They appear in literally all of our cultural myths and legends, and their traits, long flying reptiles who can breathe fire, are markedly consistent. In Norse mythology, for example, dragons are often associated with greed and are depicted as fierce, hoarding beasts that guard their treasures jealously. These dragons are often slain by heroes or tricked into revealing the locations of their treasure hoards. Famous Norse dragons include Nidog, who gnaws at the roots of Yggdrasil, Fafnir, who is famously slain by the hero Sigurd and who served as inspiration for J.R.R. Tolkien's depiction of Smaug, and of course Jormungandr, the world serpent, who is prophesied to fight Thor, leading to their mutual demise during the Norse apocalypse of Ragnarok. In many cultures, dragons are also associated with creation myths and are believed to have played a role in the formation of the world. For example, in Hindu mythology, the god Indra is said to have slain the dragon Vritra in order to release the waters that had been trapped by the creature, which allowed the world to be created. This is echoed in the earlier Sumerian and Mesopotamian religion that had the mixing of waters be the origins for both gods and dragons. According to this mythology, Tiamat, the primordial goddess of the sea, mated with Abzu, the god of the groundwater, and collectively they were the parents of all the gods. Tiamat herself was usually described as a sea serpent or a dragon. Among their children were three elder dragons that also functioned as deities in Mesopotamian culture. Keep all this mythology in mind as we move away from real-world mythology and discuss the dragons of Pathfinder. You should find the story very familiar. According to the mythology of Pathfinder, dragons state that the first two gods were representation of water, one symbolizing law and was fresh, while the other represented chaos and was salt. They were called Apsu and Tiamat. Their union produced other gods, and according to the dragons, they together created the outer plains. But in that time of creation, those plains were not yet resting places for judged souls, and were each unique and beautiful in their own right. However, the first child born of Apsu and Tiamat was a vengeful and terrible monster of a child. His name was Dahak, and he rampaged through the outer plains, and his devastation ultimately transformed some of those peaceful places into the hellscapes we know today as Hell, Abaddon, and the Abyss. Dahak forged a somber realm for himself in the plain of Hell, and, as the dragons reckon it, he was there long before Asmodeus decided that plain would belong to him. Despite Dahak turning away from his parents and brooding by himself in the depths of hell, Apsu and Tiamat would go on to have other children. 
they gave birth to six young demigods, each beautiful and made of metal. A gold god, a silver god, a brass god, a bronze god, and a copper god. Tahak grew bitter and angry towards his siblings, and he hatched a plan to capture them. Then Tahak molded them into his own image and flung them into the material plane where they shattered and became the first mortal dragons, which Tahak then hunted for pleasure. Apsu could not believe what his eldest son had done to his other children. He took on a radiant form and led his mortal offspring into battle against Tahak. The battles were fierce, resulting in heavy losses for both sides, but eventually the dragons managed to defeat Tahak. In a desperate attempt to save himself, Dahak appealed to his mother Tiamat to intervene. Though, like Apsu, she condemned Dahak for his treachery against his siblings, she couldn't bear to watch Apsu kill her eldest child. So she offered to heal the injured mortal dragons if Apsu would spare Dahak's life, an offer he accepted because the mortal dragons were all that was left of his children. However, despite Tiamat's attempt to heal them, the grievous wounds inflicted upon them by Dahak had corrupted them, and as they awoke, their shining metallic forms turned to matte chromatic hues, and their nature changed too, from beings of kindness and mercy to beings like Tahak himself, of vengeance and wrath. Eventually, Apsu would forge a kingdom for himself in the Outer Plains, the final destination of all metallic dragons when they die. This place is called the Immortal Ambulatory, and though it is a demiplane that can make its way across the various locales of the Outer Plains, it is most commonly found hovering over the Plane of Heaven. He remains the patron deity of all metallic dragons to this day. After the great battle between her husband and son ended so tragically, the dragon goddess Tiamat abandoned most known reaches of the material world in the Outer Plains. She is not worshipped on Galarian. Indeed, few dragons, including both chromatic and metals, will ever even utter her name. Finally, Dahak still possesses a domain in the Plain of Hell, a place called the Adamantine Morass located in the Eighth Circle. He is a patron deity of destruction, and though he could be considered the father of chromatics, they rarely worship him, and all fear him. I cover Dahak in more detail in my Infernal Gods Part 2 video. Although the creation myths of the dragons focus on the history of Apsu and Dahak, and especially on the conflict between chromatic and metallic dragons, there are many more types of dragons than just chromatic and metallic dragons, so it's likely that this creation myth is at least partly parable and allegory. For one thing, the notion that Apsu and Tiamat created the heavens conflicts with various other creation mythologies around Galarian, and for another, this story doesn't account for some of the other dragon breeds. One thing that is consistent among all dragon breeds, though, is the close link between mortal dragonhood and divinity. Many dragons are close in power to gods, and many gods also seem to be dragons. In Tianxia, for example, the imperial dragons have dwelt in the region since long before the rise of human empires. According to human Tian mythology, imperial dragons came to Tianxia in a time they refer to as the Age of Dragons, long before other races arose there and were charged by the gods to safeguard the land in anticipation of humanity's arrival. Imperial dragons are deeply tied to the human cultures of Tianxia, and many of the gods prominently worshipped in these eastern lands may in fact be incredibly powerful dragons. The five imperial families of Minkai were blessed by the goddess Shizuru in her guise as a dragon. The nation of Quain relies on the powerful celestial dragon for guidance, and the empire of Zahoi is directly ruled by a dynasty of sovereign dragons. Not all the dragons of the material plane dwell on planets like Galarian either. Since the ancient time of their creation, many have acquired the ability to navigate the stars and cover the vast distances between planets and solar systems. Though these powerful outer dragons can be found across the universe, they are found only rarely in Galarian, though occasionally they can be sighted in Numeria, drawn there by the mysteries of the spacecraft that crashed there long ago. Additionally, while the imperial, chromatic, metallic, and outer dragons represent the dragon families of the material plane, there are also orders of dragons that dwell in the other planes. See my Introduction to Planar Cosmology video for more details on the various planes of the multiverse. In any case, from the inner planes we get the primal dragons. From the outer planes we get the planar dragons. From the transitive planes we get the esoteric dragons. And we've only scratched the surface here, because although I've enumerated the known types of true dragons, there are very many other dragon types that are not considered true dragons, but are related species, such as linorms, drakes, wyverns, and even small pseudo-dragons. 
In a future video, I'll cover other forms of dragon kind, but in this video I will keep to true dragons, and even then I will only discuss the four types of true dragons native to the material plane. Let's start, however, with the ecology of the dragon. Dragons grow more powerful as they age, both in raw physical might and in mental and magical ability. While a newly hatched wormling might pose a threat to a small village, an ancient dragon can pose a threat to a vast army of humanoids. Dragons are fierce fighters, and those attempting to battle them can expect to be bitten, raked with their fearsome claws, buffeted by the wings, and smacked by the long tail, not to mention the various breath weapons ranging from fire, ice, acid, or even electricity. Dragons are an incredibly intelligent species as well, and older dragons in particular are almost universally formidable spellcasters. Dragon researchers have divided a dragon's lifespan into 12 age categories, but for our purposes, I want to simplify it down to four major age categories. It takes about 50 years for a dragon to become a young adult, the human equivalent of reaching about 16 to 18 years of age. Up until then, the dragon is some form of juvenile, Juvenile or younger dragons top out at a weight of just over a short ton, measuring up to 35 feet in length and sporting a 45-foot wingspan. A juvenile dragon is a large-sized creature in the game, meaning it can comfortably carry a human-sized person on its back and still remain airborne. From about 50 to 500 years of age, the dragon is considered to be an adult, whether a young adult or a more mature adult, the equivalent of a person from their 20s to their 40s. Although for humans this might be considered their prime, for dragons, as we shall see, they are only just coming into their power. Adult dragons weigh about 2 tons, measure up to 50 feet in length, and sport a 60-foot wingspan. Adult dragons are considered huge in game terms, which means, if you can picture this, they can carry a frost giant on their back and still keep aloft, or up to 4 medium-sized creatures instead. They are already truly enormous. In addition, adult dragons are competent spellcasters, equal in power to a ninth level sorcerer. From 500 to 1000 years, a dragon is considered to be an elder dragon. Elder dragons in the upper end of this bracket are often termed to be ancient dragons. Elder dragons weigh about 4 tons, measure up to 75 feet in length, and sport a 90 foot wingspan. Elder dragons are gargantuan creatures, and they have the spellcasting ability to match that of the most experienced and proficient human sorcerers and wizards in the world. Now, if a dragon were unwilling to use its magic, it would likely reach the end of its natural lifespan sometime after a thousand years of age. However, by the time a dragon reaches its first millennia, it has acquired such powerful magics that it possesses various means of slowing down the aging process and self-healing the body. As a result, some dragons will live a good deal longer than a thousand years. Such venerable beasts are called great worms, and great worms are colossal beings that defy the imagination. Weighing up to eight tons with hundred foot long bodies and two hundred foot wide wingspans, great worms are the closest mortal kind get to a godlike entity. There are few forces, even among the outer plains, that are a match for a dragon at this stage in its existence. For all their great lifespans and awesome power, few dragons show a natural tendency towards conquest or nation-building, however. Perhaps this makes sense. Dragons don't need to seek power, after all. Their unique ancestry means that as they age, they will acquire all the power that they will ever need. So why seek it out? While they don't mind having lavish homes for themselves, and they are prone to collecting treasures, they are typically quite happy to take care of themselves, knowing full well that if there is anything they need personally, they can likely go out and collect it for themselves. Even wickedly inclined chromatic dragons are more likely to periodically raid a village or request tithes than to actually conquer a place and then be burdened with its management. Those who have done this, such as the blue dragon Kazavon in Ustalav, or the likely red dragon Karl the Conqueror in Brevoy, have often not lasted long as rulers, because the actual duties of rulership tend to be a bit boring to dragons. It has been noted that a dragon's solitary nature, be they metallic or chromatic, is tied to their essential egotism, a character trait that can be found among all breeds. Such power almost necessarily creates an innate sense of self-importance, and even the wise gold dragons tend to put themselves and their needs first. Only the noble silvers are likely to put a cause before themselves. However, despite their egoism, they are certainly not omnipotent, and there are other great powers in Galarian. 
Although they are a creature type that, left to their own devices, would prefer to keep to themselves, their vast power is very tempting to other powerful creatures, be they power-hungry necromancers or liches, otherworldly demonic conquerors, or powerful giants. All are likely to attempt to recruit dragons to their service if they can. As such, even if adventurers are not particularly seeking out a confrontation with a dragon, younger chromatics in particular can often be found bound to the service of other, more power-hungry evil creatures. Adventurers may encounter dragons while exploring old ruins or dungeons, just because dragons enjoy lairing in dangerous places where others might be afraid to go. Finally, since dragons all possess a fair amount of magic, most adult or older dragons possess the ability to shapeshift into the form of a humanoid. As dragons have extremely long lifespans, many will, on occasion, want to walk in the shoes of the humanoids that dwell around their domains, walking into cities, learning their ways, and otherwise just pretending to be normal people. This means it's also possible any random person one might encounter is much more than meets the eye. Not just a town baker at all, but an elder dragon that just thought a couple of years spent learning how to make muffins might be a fun idea. Let's move away from the ecology and behavior of dragons and take a more detailed look at the various dragon types that dwell on the material plane. Imperial Dragons Although they are categorically a breed of true dragon, imperial dragons differ greatly from their metallic cousins, possessing a long serpentine body. They lack wings, but can still fly, gracefully through supernatural means. All imperial dragons also possess large horns with which they can gore prey and foes. Like all dragons, imperial dragons can breathe potent torrents of elemental force, cast spells, and perform other supernatural feats. Imperial dragons are also generally considered to be the most likely of the true dragons to use a shape-changing ability and present themselves as humans or as other similar humanoid creatures. There are five types of imperial dragons, which are as follows. Forest dragons, as the name suggests, dwell in the thickly forested areas in Tianxia. They shun technology and civilization, and prefer the company of beasts and monsters. The forest dragon is a serpentine creature with jade scales and antlers resembling those of a deer. Its scales produce a sound like grinding stone as it moves. As forest dragons age, they start to resemble the forest itself, developing mossy hair and a hide that resembles bark, housing various small animals and insects. Unlike some imperial dragons, which are known as protectors, Forest dragons are seen as territorial, predatory, and having a vicious streak. They possess a breath weapon that unleashes a swarm of biting insects, which can poison their adversaries. Adult and older forest dragons can swiftly absorb moisture from their surroundings, including from other creatures to heal themselves, often resulting in the death of plant life around them and the depletion of natural water reserves nearby. Ancient forest dragons may even possess a magical bite that can turn their foes to wood. In addition to the Imperial Dragon's shared ability to assume humanoid forms, forest dragons can transform themselves into towering trees to blend in with their surroundings. Some notable examples of forest dragons in Galarian include a number of forest dragons that can be found in the Forest of Spirits, where they are fiercely opposed by the forest's Kami guardians. In the nation of Quan Lai, a massive forest dragon rules over the bamboo forest in the Vale of Green Spears, in the nation of Minkai, an adult forest dragon named Toshihebi has made its lair in the ruins of the city of Udo. Sea dragons are a benevolent type of imperial dragon. They reside in the waters surrounding the Tianxia continent. They act as protectors for vast areas of sea and coastlines and all the creatures that dwell there. Sea dragons have also been sighted by sailors in the Obari and Okayo oceans. Sea dragons are primarily seen in various shades of blue, featuring noticeable dorsal and tail fins that assist them in swimming. However, they can also display an array of bright colors found in ocean life. These dragons possess disc-shaped scales that resemble those of fish and have webbed hands and feet. As sea dragons age, sea life will start to grow and live around them, with ancient sea dragons developing small coral reefs around their antlers. These dragons are closely linked to the waters they inhabit and possess a high degree of control over them. Their breath weapon unleashes a pulverizing ball of water, as they grow older, sea dragons can create powerful vortexes of water and even manipulate the weather. Truly ancient sea dragons can summon towering tidal waves against their adversaries. The ancient sea dragon Wei Tsi Yuan is renowned for helping sailors in need in his territory in the vicinity of the Valashmai Sea. Sky dragons are an imperial dragon species commonly found in the mountains of central and southern Tianxia. These magnificent creatures are revered protectors of all that is good and are sought after for their wisdom. Sky dragons have a blue-gray scale coloration that reflects the colors of the sky. 
As the most spiritual of the imperial dragons, visitors to Sky Dragon mountain layers often make pilgrimages for religious purposes. Sky Dragons possess a fierce ball of lightning as their breath weapon, which can be channeled through their attacks to great effect against both undead and evil outsider foes. Ancient Sky Dragons can also release bursts of electricity and wide emanations to stun their opponents and knock them out of the sky. Sky Dragons are considered metal-aspected creatures in the Tian Draconic Cycle, making them vulnerable to fire. The most famous Sky Dragon of all is probably Shinonome, the demigod, who has long served as the herald of the goddess Shizuru. Sovereign dragons are the most powerful species of imperial dragons, and are believed to have been sent by the gods to maintain balance and safeguard harmony in Tianxia. These impressive creatures have golden scales, and are usually adorned with magical armor in their dragon form. They are the only imperial dragons to have five claws on each hand, and just like humans they have hair, which can appear in many vibrant colors such as red, green, or blue. Sovereign dragons possess a unique breath weapon, which is a sharp blast of psychic energy with no elemental component. They also have a strong focus on mental prowess, with older sovereign dragons being able to easily shrug off mental effects. Known for their neutrality, sovereign dragons have historically acted as kingmakers and advisors to the nations of Tianxia, often appreciated for their wisdom. However, their staunch neutrality in all matters has been a source of criticism by some. As political advisors, they have been among the most involved in human affairs. The nation of Zahoi, for example, has been ruled by sovereign dragons for almost seven millennia, with the current dragon king Pham De Quan having successfully guided the nation through the Lunghua Collapse, which preceded the events we call the Death of Prophecy. Other sovereign dragons have carved out small nations for themselves all across Tianxia, or serve as advisors to human kings and queens. Underworld dragons are the most malevolent of all the imperial breeds. The Darklands of Tianxia are home to many of these dragons, and they construct intricate underground mazes that serve as their lairs. Underworld dragons are typically colored in dark shades of red and purple, with scales that glow ominously. Their hair seems to move like fire, and their eyes blaze with even more intensity than their scales. The superheated air that escapes their mouths can create heat distortion, obscuring their appearance. With a breath weapon that takes the form of a ball of fire that explodes some distance away, the Underworld dragon is a formidable foe. Their claws are infused with adamantine, allowing them to rend armor and objects as easily as flesh. Older underworld dragons radiate inner heat that extends several feet beyond their bodies, creating a zone of oppression around them. The most ancient underworld dragons can even unleash this inner fire, scorching the earth in all directions. In the Darklands, underworld dragons are known to rule over vast territories. Their political machinations are said to extend far beyond their borders, with rumors suggesting that they exert a significant influence over the underground kingdoms of Sekamina. Notable underworld dragons include Giojibom, who rules over a subterranean forest cavern, Jiru Karakaza, a great worm who makes his lair beneath the Three Fires volcanic mountains and has come into conflict with Minkai in the past, Ku Shaguang, who rules over the strange realm of Dripstone, and Zetzubio, whose subjects include a race of blind amphibian oracles. Metallic Dragons According to legend, the first metallic dragons came into being when Dehak shattered his siblings, the godlike metallic children of Apsu and Tiamat. When the metal gods shattered, they formed into many draconic mortal beings, each with a form similar to that favored by Dehak, large, reptilian, powerfully scaled, and possessing a vast wingspan. The resulting metallics came in five varietals, gold, silver, brass, bronze, and copper. Gold Dragons The gold dragon is considered the greatest of all dragons in nearly every respect. Gold dragons are among the largest of dragon kind, and they breathe fire as a weapon. They rule over their metallic kin with benevolence, and are held in awe by chromatics. Even the powerful red dragons hold grudging respect for golds and hate them for it. Gold dragons are considered the embodiment of all things good, orderly, and draconic, and are the first creatures that come to mind when poets and dreamers think of benign dragons. Gold dragons are by far the wisest and most intelligent of the metallic and chromatic dragons. They spend a great deal of time contemplating various considerations or problems that interest or vex them. Gold dragons are always willing to provide their insights to those who ask, especially if the inquired topic aligns with one of their interests. As such, many creatures seek out gold dragons for advice, insight, and information. They are known to be careful and unhurried advisors who sometimes ponder a situation brought to their attention for several days, lapsing into deep thought and ignoring their visitors as they do so. Gold speak with an economy of words and expect others to lend greater heed to their carefully considered remarks. 
When dealing with other creatures, gold dragons prefer to guide and advise. However, when coerced to act, they become terrible to behold in their righteous fury. Even when pitted against chromatic foes, gold dragons choose words over violence. Many chromatics who are redeemed can thank patient but forceful golds for their enlightenment. Gold dragons have two large, sweeping horns that extend back up from the base of their skulls, and most bear a few hornlets at the end of their chins, which appear from the distance like small beards. Other than these features, the faces of gold dragons vary widely. Many possess dozens of hornlets projecting from their jaws, cheekbones, and eye ridges, while others bear only the two main horns and no other facial projections. Regardless of horn numbers, all golds reflect light to shine like the sun. Gold dragons differ from other dragons in that they prefer to live in the open rather than in enclosed spaces like caves or mountains. They are believed to live openly because they are the most powerful of dragons, and even the greatest among the other dragon kindreds will rarely challenge a gold in its territory. Although they do not have layers in the traditional sense, they still have the dragon habit of hoarding wealth. Older gold dragons, however, will often carry their hordes with them, but use magical means to conceal it, making use of pocket dimensions and demi-planes rather than using a traditional dwelling. As plains and savanna dwellers, gold dragons sustain themselves by hunting and grazing on the grains of various grasses and high leaves of trees. They are careful hunters, and never take more game than herds can replace. They prey on the slow, old, and infirm, thinning out the weakest members of the herds in that way. They have also developed a liking for carefully spiced foods, thanks to the culinary advancements of humans over the past several millennia. In fact, gold dragons are increasingly choosing to live among humans in Galarian, either in their natural form or in the guise of wise humans. When residing in human settlements, gold dragons prefer to blend in with their surroundings and adopt various human personas over the course of centuries. Some golds become so attached to their assumed identities that they also portray their descendants, creating an entire family represented in a society by a single member at a time. However, after a few generations of otherwise single humans suddenly producing grown children, some neighbors may catch on to their true identities. Even when their covers are blown, gold dragons may choose to remain in the form known to the townsfolk and live as either their exposed covers or other favored personalities for hundreds of years. Although they prefer to live in cities where law and order prevail and serve the greater good, they recognize the need to live elsewhere as well. As a result, gold dragons are rumored to reside in several cities of questionable morality throughout Avistan and Garand, including places like Ardis, Igorian, Corvosa, Pangolais, and Sothis. When living in more remote locations, such as monasteries or other places of learning or contemplation not generally open to the public, gold dragons tend instead to reveal their true forms, except when their size becomes an inconvenience. Gold dragons enjoy socializing with other metallic dragons, although they generally prefer the company of their own kind. If gold dragons live within a reasonable distance of each other, they will meet several times a year to discuss spreading their philosophies and ideals among their neighbors. However, these meetings often turn into casual get-togethers, where they drink wine and catch up. Once or twice a year, a gold dragon will host a gathering of metallics, including bronzes, silvers, and occasionally brasses and coppers. These events tend to be more serious, with discussions about the state of the world and how dragons can make a positive impact. On rare occasions, however, some elder gold dragons with the right level of magical acumen will emit a powerful calling to all dragons in Galarian. When this occurs, it is called a convocation of dragons, and when such a powerful dragon calls for a meeting, even the rebellious chromatic dragons pay attention. With the exception of the unsociable black dragons, representatives from every type of dragon come together at a neutral location, often an uninhabited island somewhere in the region known as the Shackles, to discuss, debate, and sometimes fight over the issues at hand. These convocations usually only last a few days, and even the most successful ones often end in violence. Despite the tension caused by so much deep-seated animosity in one place, these meetings do often result in subtle changes to the pan-draconic society. The latest convocation was called by the gold dragon named Astralia in 4607, following the apparent death of Aridon and its effect on Galarian and its dragons. Astralia and her metallic allies expressed a desire to help the humans in their hour of need, particularly with regard to the world wound, and indeed many metallics did end up supporting the crusaders there, including notably the silver dragon Terendelev, who died in the outset of the Fifth Crusade while the chromatics believed that human issues were not of concern to dragons. One notable exception, however, came from the elder red dragon Grathalax. 
he broke rank with the chromatic dragons to suggest that the death of prophecy signified it was a well-omened time for dragonkind to unite and kill Dahak, believing it could lead to a redemption of the chromatic kindreds. Previous convocations have discussed a range of topics. There was one call during the rise of Daralathixil in the Five Kings Mountains, during the period known as the Wild Era. See my dwarf video for History of the Five Kings Mountains for more details on this period. There was one called shortly after the return of the elves, and there was one called 10,000 years ago to discuss the meaning and implications of the Earthfall Cataclysm. Gold Dragons of Renown Probably the most famous gold dragon on Galarian is Menkare, the founder and ruler of the island nation of Hermia. Hermia was an uninhabited island until 4552, when Menkare decided to use it as the site of a unique social experiment he called the Glorious Endeavor. The Glorious Endeavor is Menkare's attempt to perfect the human race. It is a long-term project which aims to make each generation healthier, more intelligent, and more talented than the last. Most of the subjects are human, but members of other races are occasionally included if they have particular skills or traits that Menkare feels would be beneficial to the community. Hermia is governed for the greater good, but the ultimate authority and arbiter of the greater good is Menkare himself, and every adult has signed a contract of citizenship recognizing this fact. Below Menkare is a 13-member Council of Enlightenment who handle the day-to-day -day governance of his realm. In addition, almost every citizen has some kind of official authority in their area of expertise. Menkare wishes the citizens to govern themselves as much as possible. This allows them to make best use of their talents and push forward the glorious endeavor. Life in Hermia is said to be peaceful, comfortable, and progressive, the envy of the world. It is also communal. Citizens are encouraged to give and take in accordance with their needs, though abuses of the system are reported to the Council of Enlightenment. However, there are rumors that Hermian society is not the utopia it appears. Some foreign sailors perceive an undercurrent of fear beneath the citizens' apparent contentment. There are even tales of rebels opposing Menkara's rule hiding out in the forest at the far side of the isle. Finally, any form of organized religion is banned in Hermia, and perhaps Menkari's clampdown on religion is to avoid giving his people access to any powers that might rival his own. Another famous gold dragon is Parnoneryx, who once fought alongside Iomede before her ascension. Some time after Iomede parted ways with him to become a deity, Parnoneryx was defeated by the white dragon Vesna Gazradin, who trapped him for centuries in a tomb of ice deep in the Menador Mountains. After being freed by the Glorious Reclamation's leader, Lord Marshal Alexara Cancellarian, he joined the Glorious Reclamation and vowed to free Cheliax from House Thrun. However, in the course of the Hell's Vengeance adventure path, Parnoneryx was later slain by a band of evil adventurers working for House Thrun. There is also said to be a gold dragon named Astarathian, who resides in the Nidalee's capital of Pangole, the capital city of a country whose state religion is devoted to Zonkuthon, the midnight god of darkness and torture. Disguised as a simple human citizen, Astarathian sells staple foods to the people of the city at prices lower than anyone else. Legend has it that those who say the right things will even receive his food for free. Despite living in Pangole for nearly 450 years, Astarathian has never kept the same disguise for more than a few decades, and he never portrays family members of his previous false selves. During his time in Adal's capital, Astarathian has provided hundreds of people with food, shelter, and hope. Only once has Astarathian revealed his true form, in the year 4519, a night referred to as the Night of the Golden Moon. Finally, the gold dragon Garathalix maintains a fabulous prison on Valkus Isle just off the Nexian coastline. According to legend, when the Archmage Nex was still in the early days of experimenting with the reality-warping magics that would later give him near-infinite power, his early efforts on Valkus Isle failed, and the horrific creatures the Wizard King summoned overran the island. Nex and his apprentices created a one-way, foolproof barrier called the Stalwart Wall to surround the isle. Later, the gold dragon Garathalix discovered this horrific island and took it upon himself to use the island for a greater good. Garathalix spent months surveying Valkus Isle from above, flying over the demons, magical anomalies, corrupt priests, and other irredeemable beings that infested the island's interior. He also analyzed the stalwart wall, its characteristics, its possible weaknesses. During his reconnaissance, he discovered a lush, secluded islet located at the east of the main island, just beyond the stalwart wall. He named this place Ephrisia from a word that meant lighthouse in Celestial, and claimed it as his home.
Since then, Garathalix purged the interior of its original uncontrolled monstrosities, but then converted Valkus Isle into a sophisticated prison for the containment of Galarian's most notorious evildoers. Here, the most vile Gebite bloodlords, depraved servants of the Whispering Tyrant, and other dangerous denizens are kept on lockdown by the ancient dragon. Even after centuries, the dragon still uses Afrisia as a base where he collaborates with his allies to achieve his objective of containing the world's most dangerous denizens. Silver Dragons Silvers are often referred to as the paladins of dragons, due to their embodiment of the highest ideals such as justice, honor, valor, and mercy. They are slenderer than many other breeds of metallics, and they breathe an icy frost breath. They fearlessly fight against evil, but also extend mercy to those who repent. Their courage and righteousness inspire others to rally around them in times of war. In the conflict between the metallic and chromatic dragons, silvers served as the vanguard and backbone of the metallic armies. They fight with grace and honor, upholding the principles of goodness and law. From the moment of their birth, silvers are aware of the expectations placed upon them. They must remain steadfast in their courage, uphold the law, and ensure that others do the same. They are expected to punish wrongdoers in a manner that is merciful and just. Silvers accept this responsibility willingly, and often seek out even greater duties. Their shiny silver-white scales reflect the sunlight, acting as beacons of light in the darkest of times. However, their scales can lose their luster and turn a dull grey, reflecting the state of their souls. Silvers who exhibit this change are encouraged to polish their scales, so to speak, by seeking guidance to refresh and refocus their mind and spirits. Silvers stand apart from their draconic brethren, including even their esteemed gold dragon cousins. While dragons, even metallics, can sometimes be associated with selfishness and greed, silver dragons are always known for their altruism, goodness, justice, and honor. These traits are inherent in their nature, with a divine spark guiding them from the moment they hatch from their eggs. Since the days of Argix, the first of their kind, silver dragons have appealed to Apsu and other deities of goodness and law to impose more and more rigorous regulations for them to adhere to. By following these numerous rules, which are imposed by divine agents, but desired by the dragons themselves, silver dragons demonstrate their respect for their draconic ancestry. This strict adherence to the rules instills in silver dragons a sense of overwhelming pride that could be compared to draconic hubris in other breeds. Even the self-centered red dragons cannot match the level of pride exhibited by the silvers when they correctly follow all the rules that have been put forth before them. These various codes of conduct, oaths of service, and regulations become increasingly restrictive as they age as well, and soon such controls extend to every aspect of their lives, including even natural acts like procreation, each of which becomes carefully ritualized. While most creatures would balk at such strict regulation, silver dragons not only accept it, but seem to thrive under it. They require these controls which are designed to regulate their behavior as they age, and many young silver dragons eagerly adopt codes of conduct meant for older dragons well in advance of their age. As expected from their role as dragon paladins, silver dragons are highly religious. Most of them worship Apsu, but not all do. Some have started to follow Ayamade, the goddess of paladins, particularly the silver communities in Mendev, who have fought alongside humans and all free folk against the demons pouring forth from the world wound. However, because of the power and reliability of silver dragons as mortal servants, various other imperial lords have sought out silver dragons, so silvers may be found in service to all manner of goodly gods and demigods. Silver dragons seldom live in solitude, and instead prefer to be accompanied by gold dragons, celestials, and other beings devoted to upholding justice, order, and fairness. Despite their embrace of community, they tend to view other silver dragons as more rivals than allies, and they tend to congregate with each other only to mate or when facing overwhelming adversity. When forced to collaborate, they insist on appointing a neutral arbiter as their leader, at least for the duration of their joint venture. One exception to this is that silver dragons in a given region will convene yearly to discuss matters related to the area's conditions, crusades, or quests that they might be undertaking. Silver Dragons of Renown one of the most famous silvers in Galarian was Terendelev, one of the sworn protectors of the Mendevian border town of Kenebres. There she acted as an enforcer, patrolling the city in the company of a dozen human paladins. Terendelev had once been part of a strike team that moved across the border to approach the world wound. However, she returned from that excursion, badly scarred and horrifically wounded, bearing three of her human companions with her. Two of the humans she brought back later died from some mysterious ailment or curse they had contracted near the world wound. From that day she fell into a black mood, finding that only wise counsel from her mentor, the gold dragon Haliceliax, could alleviate the darkness she carried. 
She would never find the peace she was looking for, however, as in 4718 the city of Kenebres was besieged and she was slain by Descari, the demon lord of locusts. Another famous silver dragon can be found in the Linorm kingdoms. Avaleru is a silver dragon who guards the Ulfen Memorial of Hero's Rest on Hagreach's eastern border with Irisen. The memorial is a place to honour the most famous of those who have died defending Hagreach from the Iriseni raiders and winter witches. The dragon hates the Iriseni witches and their agents, and it is said that Avaleru uses a part of the regular yearly tithes she gets as a guardian of the Ulfen memorial to grant magical boons to kind and goodly-mannered Ulfen, assuming the form of a mysterious silver-haired woman. You can hear more about the province of Hagreach in my regional deep dive on the Linorm kingdoms. In Absalom, at the famous White Grotto Bardic School, the master of string instruments, who presents as a half-elven woman named Detren Rilwin, is rumoured to be a silver dragon, though since it is a school specialised in the weaving of tall tales, this could also be fanciful speculation. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, silver dragons may take all kinds of patrons, and one dragon of renown is sworn to the fey eldest known as Shika of the Many. More information on Shika can be found in my religion series video on the fey pantheon. Erenax the Feymarked, as she is called, is in fact a half fey dragon. Her father, the great dragon Silverstep, who used to live in the River Kingdoms, where Silverstep Lake is still named after him, left the material plane centuries ago to be with his fey lover in the First World. Their child, the half fey dragon Erenax, swore fealty to Sheikah and underwent numerous missions for her patron. Most recently, she has returned to the River Kingdoms to deal with threats posed there by evil fey creatures in service to an Anku named Orsig. She is currently attempting to gather allies for herself, but few are forthcoming. The rumours of evil fey have kept most locals and even potential adventurers away. Aranax, however, still hopes to secure aid from allies before confronting Orsig and his minions. Brass Dragons Brass dragons are known to be the most whimsical and light-hearted of all the true dragons. They breathe a bright blue streak of superheated plasma, not terribly unlike the fire breath of gold dragons except in appearance. They often act foolishly and joke around with shorter-lived races, sometimes even pretending to be simpletons. However, this is all a guise to put others at ease and make them underestimate the brass dragon's intelligence, which, as with all dragon breeds, is already equal to that of an adult human in childhood. Despite not being as dim-witted as they seem, brass dragons are easily distracted and tend to be flighty in nature. These dragons are gregarious and absent-minded, making them great allies for good-natured adventurers. They can act as guides, advisors, or as diplomats for powerful leaders, or even as entertaining tavern patrons. Above all else, brass dragons genuinely want to help others and work hard, typically though only in short bursts of focused labor separated by long periods of conversation and distraction. While they may appear friendly and passive, foolish assumptions about brass dragons being harmless or unwilling to attack those who anger them can lead to trouble. Brass dragons have a smooth beauty, mixed with craggy ruggedness, with thick keratin ridges just beneath their scales that sweep back from their jaws and grow into long, disjointed horns as they age. Hatchlings have smooth faces, with only two horn nubs projecting above and behind their skulls, while the oldest brass dragons have over a dozen horns extending back from their wrinkled and folded faces. These keratin folds also appear on the backs of their legs, where their wings connect to their flanks, and along the last two vertebrae of their tails. While they usually only produce tiny hornlets, some brass dragons may have legs, wings, and tails studded with crooked horns extending a foot or more in length. Brass dragons are known for their sociable and talkative nature, yet ironically they prefer to live in relatively inhospitable environments, as their physiology favours hot, dry, arid environs. Typically, brass dragons make their lairs in rocky outcroppings found in deserts, within close proximity to water sources such as rivers or oases, usually within a half-day's flight distance. This places them along major trade routes, making it easier for them to exchange information with human traders and nomads. Nomads and caravan masters often seek brass dragons' aid, since they are known to share water resources with those in need, making them attractive allies. However, this altruism sometimes creates conflict with blue dragons, another water-controlling species. In Thuvia, the water lords often seek to ally themselves with brass dragons to control the water flow. But brass dragons are careful in their choice of allies, and they will not provide aid to water lords with reputations for cruelty, avarice, or lack of compassion. While brass dragons are known for being the friendliest of dragon breeds, they still do retain an egoist nature, which manifests itself in the form of their information networks. They often establish large and intricate networks of contacts throughout their territories, including human traders, nomads, jinn, sphinxes, and other intelligent desert dwellers. 
Like many dragons, some brasses do use magic to blend in with their neighbours, but most enjoy the fame and notoriety they gain from being a living dragon. Owners of establishments such as taverns, inns, restaurants, and flop houses usually welcome brass dragons for their spendthrift ways, as being frequented by a dragon draws in large crowds, particularly when the dragon visits. Brass dragons hoard knowledge, both written and oral, and are prodigious readers. Unfortunately, their ability to retain information is the weakest among metallic dragons, which combines poorly with their propensity to exaggerate facts for the sake of better stories. Together, these traits make brass dragons unreliable fonts of knowledge, news, and information. That said, brass dragon hordes sometimes contain more books, scrolls, and engraved tablets than many human libraries, and unlike every other aspect of their being, brass dragons are obsessive about keeping their personal libraries organized and well cared for. Brass Dragons of Renown Among the most famous brass dragons of Galarian is Sarathil, who was born in Cheliax before the fall of Aradin and the rise of House Thrun. She supported House Davian during the Civil War and fought in the southwest of the country until she was one of the last survivors of a great battle. Though she knew the need was great, she had grown tired of war and fled to Karjit in Rahadum and from there to Thuvia, where she has lived for the past century. Sarathil has built a vast network of contacts, allies, and friends that extends across Thuvia and beyond into Assyrian, Rahadum, Kadira, and all along the Golden Road. Although she originally acquired her contacts by chance, over time she has developed one of the most far-reaching information networks in the Inner Sea, encompassing the domains of two other lesser brass dragons. She rarely works to maintain her network now, but it is held together thanks in large part to her close friend, the Jin Alakzan, who helps her maintain her many varied relationships with his prodigious generosity and his loyal friendship to her. Sarathil's network supports her pet projects, including a public works project in Manaket, and keeps her informed of events in Thuvia and in her abandoned homeland of Cheliax. Another notorious brass dragon is Helexa, residing periodically in Absalom, who has long been a known information broker for the Pathfinder Society. However, in recent years, the Society has tended to double or triple check her provided intelligence. This is because of her tragic involvement with the infamous Volume 11 of the Pathfinder Chronicles. Alexa, it is believed, passed on numerous inaccurate or misleading statements regarding the nature of certain lands she had explored to the Pathfinder chronicler Delania Pontius in an effort to make them more interesting. These tales were published in the aforementioned volume, and then these inaccuracies ended up causing the numerous injuries and deaths before the volume was finally amended. However, perhaps the saddest known tale of brass dragons in Galarian is that of the brazen clutch in Catapesh. They say in the bazaars of Catapesh anything is for sale, and dragons are apparently no exception. In the last ten years, the eggs of an elder brass found dead in her den by Noel scavengers found their way to Fatima Jelabar, a senior agent of the Aspis Consortium, and thence to the Garden of Unearthly Delights, Fatima's exclusive menagerie and auction house, which buys and sells rare creatures to all manner of wealthy clients. The clutch originally consisted of five eggs, but one dragon has been sold to a private collector, and another died when Fatima punished the dragons for trying to escape. Today the remaining three are held in a specially designed enclosure, and Fatima arranges for tourists to view the brass dragons in a simulation of their native environment, kept as little more than caged animals. Their names are Inferno, Sirocco, and Scorpion, and though young, the three wormlings are already working out a plan to escape their predicament. Bronze Dragons Bronze dragons are known for their contemplative, curious, and thoughtful nature, which makes them ideal scholars, sages, and seers. They have an insatiable thirst for knowledge, and are always looking for opportunities to expand their intellectual horizons. While they may not possess the raw magical acumen of silver and gold dragons, they are still considered the great thinkers of the metallic dragon families. Bronze dragons favor more watery environments, and they breathe a corrosive fluid that can dissolve flesh and bone and even metal. Bronze dragons excel in roles that require contemplation, patience, and meticulousness, such as numerology, astrology, research, scribe work, and other contemplative roles. They are exceptional guardians, protectors, and bodyguards as well, willing to spend vast amounts of time waiting and watching over their charges. Bronze dragons played a crucial role in the first great battle against the Chromatics when Apsu and Dahak waged war with each other during the Age of Creation. Today they continue to protect their kin and other living creatures against harm and have stood as living shields against the forces of evil for countless millennia. Bronzes lack the massive racks of horns and bony protrusions of their brass and copper cousins. Instead, they have sleek heads and bodies with membranous frills that help keep them cool on land and protect their delicate gills in water. 
They also possess webbed toes, flaps of skins at the crooks of their forelimbs, and paddle-like fins along the ends of their tails that they can use as rudders in water and fold flat on land. However, their small wing-to-body ratio means they must exert themselves more than the rest of their kin to fly. Bronze dragons possess wide gills, located below and behind their large fan-like head frills, allowing them to breathe as easily in water as air. They keep these gills closed with strong muscles when on the surface, but use their frills to sweep small jetties of water into their gills for oxygen when underwater. Being equally comfortable on land and on water, they usually prefer to live within a day's flight of an ocean or a vast lake, but most of their possessions do not fare well in water, so they often remain on land or underground. They occasionally visit large bodies of water to harvest seafood, which is their favorite food. Their hyper-efficient draconic metabolisms enable them to survive on a single day's haul of fish for up to a year, which they dry and store for consumption after long naps. Bronze dragons have minimal impact on their surroundings and do not eat the meat of land and air animals, so herders and ranchers need not fear the proximity of bronze dragons to their herding grounds. Bronze dragons are not quick to make friends, but those who do befriend them gain loyal, albeit somewhat distant, allies and companions. Most bronzes prefer to keep to themselves, enjoying the quiet solitude of vast libraries and secluded forest clearings. They are the least social of all the metallic dragons, and often disappear for years or even decades at a time before suddenly reappearing to visit their favorite bookseller or libraries. Some bronzes combine their vast intellects with their voracious reading habits and write epic-length treatises on some obscure subject or another. Bronze Dragons of Renown the four draconic banking families of Taldor probably represent the most famous, or even infamous, of the world's bronze dragons. The Royal Draconic Banking Proclamation, made by King de Halvian in 1941, allowed bronze dragons to establish banks and charge interest within the four cities of Casimir, Meheto, Apara, and Zimar, without paying taxes to the crown. As a result, bronze dragons came to call Taldor the Generous Land. This was, of course, almost 1,500 years before the Dragon Plague, in which an orb of dragonkind was used to send many of Taldor's dragons into a destructive frenzy, including a number of bronze dragons. After that incident, Talden's sentiment turned against the traditionally larger population of metallics that they had, and fewer bronzes can now be found in these cities. Yet, the law was never repealed, and so the descendants of the original bronzes still live near these cities, as the four draconic banking families, though many of their day-to-day -day operations are now trusted to human officers. Although they pay no taxes on the gold gained through their banking interests, the bronzes continue to inject gold into the local economies, and are among the best-regarded metallics in Taldor. On the opposite side of the spectrum from the draconic bankers, there is the monastery of Shung Li, located in the Tian nation of Datang Ma, where a venerable bronze dragon named Master Hei Fa Chu resides. Over the past 1500 years that he has been at the monastery, Master Hei Fa Chu has helped fend off over five dozen attacks and attempted thefts. He has mentored and advised thousands of devoted monks, he has mediated several conflicts, and he has established and meticulously organized one of the three largest libraries in the nation. Finally, in the coastal cliffs of Aspo Bay in Andoran, there is a young brass dragon named Sompanax that has gained a distinguished reputation for himself in the last 20 years or so. A constant terror to chalish slavers and naval captains, the abolitionist dragon Sompanax is quickly growing into a living legend. Stories of his daring ambushes against well-armed slave ships and the slave revolts they spark are retold with snarls and chelish ports. Though he lairs on the ender side of Aspo Bay, the bronze dragon has engaged chelish sailors in pitched sea battles well into their nation's territorial waters. Although most Andorish people support the dragon, he has complicated diplomatic relationships between Andoran and Cheliax, which have become increasingly strained in the wake of the dragon's bold forays and the growing militia of former slaves flocking to the dragon's cause. The Chalish government has sought recompense for damages inflicted by the dragon, but the Andoran government, for their part, insists he's an independent actor and that the people of Andoran are not responsible for his actions. Copper Dragons Copper dragons are fiercely independent and value personal freedom above all else, often willing to fight to the death to defend their right to choose how and where they live. Unsurprisingly, the democratic nation of Andoran has the highest concentration of copper dragons in Avistan. Many copper dragons, however, prefer to live in places where their talents as freedom fighters are needed, such as near Mathis or Vidrian. Despite their idealism, copper dragons can easily become distracted and bored, making them intense but short-lived allies. They are more likely to offer aid if the task can be completed quickly, with any endeavor lasting more than a few days, risking the loss of their interest. 
Coppers possess the largest number of head horns among the metallic dragon breeds, which can weigh hundreds of pounds on the largest specimens. Their thick necks and iconic crowns of horns are their most distinctive features. Copper dragons can also serve as intermediaries between more powerful dragons and human allies, although their reliability can be an issue. They are also the only dragon species known to frequently, and sometimes hedonistically, drink to excess, often taking humanoid forms when they drink so as to reduce their body mass and thereby decrease their tolerance to alcohol. Copper dragons are typically flighty in their worldviews, often changing their minds on a particular topic every time they speak with someone with a strong point of view in a persuasive argument. They are the most likely of all the metallic dragons to grow angry and rampage as chromatic dragons sometimes do. But when they realize the consequences of their actions, they become genuinely remorseful and may sink into a depressed lethargy or exhibit manic enthusiasm to undo their destruction. Other good dragons tend to remain politely aloof from them because of their unpredictable behavior. Copper dragons are the only metallic breed that is not universally hated by the chromatic dragons, who find them the least dogmatic and therefore the most open of the metallics to other viewpoints. Perhaps because of their own destructive tendencies, copper dragons are forgiving of the faults and vices of other creatures, especially other coppers and chromatics. Copper dragons prefer warm, dry climates that are not quite deserts, and tend to reside in dry pine forests found in the foothills of tall mountains, although they will live elsewhere if their interests take them there. These dragons are among the most transient of dragon kind, rarely staying in one layer for more than a few years before moving on. In general, copper dragons have a minimal impact on their surrounding compared to other large omnivores, but they can consume as much food as several bears. Copper dragons typically follow the live and let live philosophy and are more likely than other dragon breeds to adopt herbivorous diets. In a unique trait among dragons, copper dragons also have a sweet tooth and enjoy sweet foods. They visit bakeries and towns, while those living away from civilization prefer berries, fruits with juicy pulp, honey and sugar cane. Copper Dragons of Renown the Galton Coppers were a group of copper dragons who first supported the Galton Revolution against Imperial Cheliax and House Thrun. When Galt first declared independence, twelve copper dragons quickly took up residence in the territory to aid in the struggle. However, once the country achieved secession, most of the original twelve departed to pursue other interests. Of the four who stayed behind, one died during the first round of political purges, while the remaining three went into hiding. There were rumors of their continued but covert involvement in Galton affairs, but the trio of Galton coppers have not had confirmed sightings in any of the major Galton cities in nearly eight decades. Famous for his frivolous spending habits, ribald humor, and well-documented cowardice, the young copper dragon Wataxashil remains arguably Andoran's small city of Alfton's main attraction. The town is close enough to the Five Kings Mountains that it has long been a place to which the great red Daralathixil has visited his wrath upon, and when this does occur, Wataxashil historically hides away in a local inn and helps the town folk pay whatever coins or treasures the so-called Sixth King demands. The copper's appearance some years ago did help push the balance in the town's favor during a werewolf raid 50 years ago, and the townsfolk were so pleased they failed to inquire as to why he suddenly appeared. With the passing of years, though, some citizens of Ulfton are beginning to question why the drunkard dragon mysteriously appeared and why he seems completely uninterested in leaving. Another copper dragon of legend is the ghost of Megara, a copper dragon who is said to protect a lighthouse on an island off the coast of Rahadum. According to the story, on the southern shore of Fahalan Island, before the Oath Wars in Rahadum, there was a temple complex and a lighthouse called the Guide Star of Desna. It served as a guiding light for ships navigating the treacherous Eye of Abendego. The priests who maintained it were among the last religious figures in Rahadum to be exiled or executed for their beliefs. After secular forces took control of the lighthouse, they perished during a severe winter plague and their superiors gave up on occupying the complex. Rumors of a curse surrounding the lighthouse began to spread, but locals whispered about a friendly light emanating from the tower when travelers were in dire need of guidance. The guiding light was in fact the work of Megara, the copper dragon that had taken up residence there. In those years, Megara would travel western Garen from time to time, and had a short and tempestuous love affair with another copper in the shackles named Rokir at one time. Later, Rokir sent a free captain of the shackles who helmed a ship called the Farthing to bear a message to Megara to ask to see her again. Though Megara accompanied the Farthing back to the shackles, she and the ship were set upon by a red dragon named Ashak, who Megara fought to the death in order to give the Farthing a chance to escape. But for Megara, this would prove not to be the end as her spirit was drawn back to the Guide Star, where it remains to this day, guiding the virtuous, but protecting it fiercely against those who would attempt to loot and pillage the ancient site. Chromatic Dragons 
According to legend, the first chromatic dragons came into being when Tiamat resurrected the fallen metallics that had perished in the battle against Ahak. The wounds they had sustained against the first and eldest of the dragons seeped into their bodies, and they became corrupted versions of their former selves. Gold dragons became red dragons, silver dragons became white dragons, brass dragons became green dragons, bronze dragons became black dragons, and copper dragons became blue dragons. Red dragons. As the corrupted version of gold dragons, red dragons are the most powerful and imposing of all chromatics, and regard every other creature as inferior, with the exception of the golds, whom they avoid whenever possible. When reds learn of other dragons being defeated by lesser beings, they do not offer sympathies or regrets. Instead, they scorn their brethren for suffering such a fate and consider them weak. Although it may appear that they are indifferent to the deaths of their fellow reds, this is far from the truth. Red dragons firmly believe that only the strong should survive, and that the weak must serve or fall. However, they recognize that even the weakest and least deserving creatures might on occasion have luck on their side and overcome their betters. They do not believe that exceptional humans can surpass their own power. Therefore, Reds shed no tears for their kin's demise, but will sometimes seek out those who were responsible for their defeat and ensure that such a thing does not happen again. They may mock, but they will avenge. There are many stories of courageous dragon slayers returning home with the trophies of their kills, only to have their homes and communities destroyed by a raging, flaming red dragon. These cautionary tales warn mortals to leave the Reds alone. Red dragons are a sight to behold, magnificent and utterly terrifying. Every aspect of red dragons exudes terror, yet there is a fierce beauty in their monstrosity as well, with jaws capable of snapping iron bars and the masts of ships, and muscular tails that can break through stone walls, red dragons are the epitome of predatory superiority. Their muzzles are relatively blunt, with thick jaws filled with dagger-like teeth that extend beyond the gums, giving them a snaggletooth look that adds to their ferocity. Small nose horns extend up from behind the tips of their muzzles, and sharp ridges of steel-hard scales follow back along their faces. Longer and thicker scales provide them with a spiky appearance that many intelligent beings find disturbing and fearsome. Their cord-like muscles allow them to move with great speed and grace. Legends abound about red dragons terrorizing communities near mountains, often choosing volcanoes as their homes and demanding tribute from nearby human settlements. Red dragons are among the most deeply corrupted by Dahak's curse, routinely exhibiting covetousness, hatred, and lust to an unparalleled degree and are notoriously difficult to reform. This corruption, combined with the natural draconic tendency towards egotism and their unparalleled natural might, makes them very dangerous entities to have even as a distant neighbor. They may rampage indiscriminately, unconcerned with the abilities of those who dare to challenge them or the tales of those who claim to have defeated others of their kind. Generally speaking, younger red dragons cause more damage to the ecological balance of their territories than their older counterparts. Despite eating less than their larger, older kin, except during growth spurts, younger reds roam their domains more frequently, engaging in hunting, killing, and destruction as their whims dictate. Older dragons, on the other hand, spend less time outside their lairs, and even when they do emerge, they tend to focus their destructive impulses on more distant human settlements. They delight in tormenting these settlements, burning down buildings, dropping peasants from great heights, demanding coins and other treasures, and then returning to their remote lair. The lands immediately surrounding the lairs of younger reds instead tend to bear more obvious scars of fiery destruction, so it is easier for dragon hunters to seek them out and hunt them down. Red dragons possess the greatest appetites of all dragons, for treasure, food, and destruction. Luckily for living creatures residing within their territories, the powerful fires within their stomachs allow them to consume and digest nearly any non-poisonous substance. These internal supernatural fires only go out when the dragons die, allowing reds to eat nearly any animal, plant, or mineral for sustenance. Red dragons are notorious for their insatiable greed, which is unmatched among their dragon kindred. They are known to accumulate vast wealth and treasure, it's not uncommon for their immense coin hordes to fill chambers larger than most human dwellings. The treasures they possess surpass even the collections of the greatest human museums. Red dragons covet all forms of treasure, from coins and precious stones to exquisite jewelry and art pieces, masterfully crafted weapons and armor, and even the most powerful magic items and artifacts. Of all the treasures that they possess, however, red dragons value living creatures the most. Like their black dragon cousins, they keep slaves, usually elves or humans if they can get their hands on them. However, unlike black dragons, red dragons do not intentionally torture or torment their slaves. Instead, they keep their slaves alive and physically healthy, considering them delicate treasures to be admired and enjoyed. Red Dragons of Renown Perhaps the most famous of all red dragons has only recently been identified as such. 
I'm referring, of course, to the human warlord known as Karl the Conqueror, who famously unified the country of Brevoy, a figure I discuss in much more detail in my Northeast Avistan deep dive video. Karl assembled a vast army in Ayobaria, descended from the north, and took the country with the aid of two other red dragons. Then, a few years after his conquest, he abruptly departed, leaving his dragon-blooded human heirs to rule in his absence. Since that time, Karl's entire lineage has vanished, and none now know what happened to the ancient scions of the Dragonscale throne. Brevoy's various noble families now jockey for control of this previously ununified land. The second most famous red dragon is probably Daralathixil. In the Five Kings Mountains, northeast of Droskar's Crag, there resides a dragon of immense size, age, and power. Known as Daralathixil, he is often referred to as the Sixth King of the Five Kings Mountains, and prefers to be addressed as the King or the Emperor. His influence extends for hundreds of miles, and his vast territory is home to several other formidable chromatic dragons. Both draconic and mortal scholars estimate Daralathixil's age to be over 2,000 years, and though his appearances are becoming less frequent, few dare to suggest that he is weakening with age. Any talk of his demise or infirmity seems to provoke his wrath, causing the people of the Darkmoon Vale in northeast Andoran and other nearby areas to speak of him in hushed and reverent tones, hoping to avoid his ire. When Daralathixil does take action, his rampage of terror spreads across northwestern Andoran, southern Isgur, and southwestern Druma. He demands tribute in the form of coins, treasures, and maidens, for whom he has a strong preference for elves. Any community that fails to meet his demands swiftly enough is met with flames, their towns burned to ruins, and their cities weakened. Despite calls for aid going across Andoran and Druma, the combined effort of both these human nations and the dwarves of the Five Kings Mountains have so far proved inadequate to meet the challenge of addressing a dragon of the size and power of Daralathixil. The so-called Lords of the Kortos Mounts represent a whole group of reds. They are a community of red dragons located in the Isle of Kortos, dangerously close to the crucial trade hub of Absalom. Adventurers from Absalom routinely make the dangerous trek into the mountains to try to kill the elders of this community before they become a threat too perilous for the so-called greatest city to manage. The last major dragon in the Kortos Mountains to be slain was Mejeric Stelai, a tyrant who survived 500 years and had just begun unifying the other dragon lords under her rule when a major expedition slew her in 4592. There is also the famous dragon Asulek, who torments Osirian from his volcanic home in the area known as the Footprints of Rovagug. Attempts to infiltrate his known lair have so far all met with failure, with only one survivor among the dozens of glory-seeking dragon hunters returning to report on the lair's seemingly impassable defenses. More information on the footsteps of Rovagug can be found in my Osirian deep dive video. Finally, the red dragon Glarataxis has plagued Corvosa and her holdings, appearing for several months at a time to torment and destroy, before retiring to his still unknown lair to rest for several decades. Thankfully, Glarataxis has not been seen since before the murder of King Eodred and the ascension of the Crimson Queen, whose rulership was followed by riots, the outbreak of a terrible disease, the dissolution of Corvosa's most potent defense force, the Griffin Riding Sable Company, and finally culminated in her being supplanted as monarch by a group of heroic patriots. Should Glarataxis return while Corvosa is still in a state of rebuilding, then it could prove a great challenge for the city indeed. White Dragons White dragons were corrupted silvers once, and like silvers, they emit an icy blast as their breath weapon. However, while silvers are among the most highly reputed of metallics, Dahak's corruption was exceptionally hard on the fallen silvers, and white dragons tend to sit at the very bottom of the draconic pecking order. They are almost universally viewed with great disdain by other dragons, who see them as nasty, brutish, and short-tempered creatures. They act more like feral predators than representatives of dragon kind. While all chromatic dragons share a particularly powerful instinct for self-preservation, bordering on cowardice, white dragons are unrepentantly craven. Their rumored lack of intelligence is exaggerated, but their tendency to revel in cruel, crude humor underscores why they have this reputation to begin with. Driven by instinct and their ever-gnawing stomachs, young white dragons rarely attempt communication with other creatures, except to form crude bargains that bring them more prey or treasure. Despite their disadvantaged beginnings, white dragons eventually age into cunning, careful schemers. While their most careful plans might seem ludicrously simple to their other more intelligent chromatic cousins, the schemes of the cleverest white dragons can nonetheless require months to come to fruition. The cold, long-smoldering fury of white dragons drives many of them into lives filled with vengeance-seeking and complicated arrangements that lead to the ruin of their targets, 
or else to mounting frustrations as their own impatience undermines their carefully laid plans. White dragons have a distinctive appearance, characterized by large webbed horns radiating out from the backs of their skulls and connected by tough fibrous membranes. They also possess crag-like hornlets on their chins and lower jaws. The rough texture of their faces extends over much of their bodies, allowing them to break up their silhouettes and granting them additional camouflage in their snowy homes. White dragon scales are thick and rough to the touch, and the tiny ridges that give them their rough feel trap in heat, keeping the whites warm even in the coldest of climates. White dragons reign over the windswept fields of snow that comprise the crown of the world, where they dominate the tundra and arctic wastelands of the far north. They assert themselves as the rulers of sparsely populated and undesirable kingdoms, with their vast territory spanning hundreds or thousands of square miles, but containing fewer intelligent beings than most towns. White dragons are indifferent to controlling those who reside within their territories, viewing all other living creatures as either prey or foe. White Dragons of Renown A number of white dragons have been recruited into the service of Jarl Nargarak, the frost giant overlord of the Tusk Mountains, whom I discuss in more detail in my Realm of the Mammoth Lords deep dive video. One particularly large white dragon serves as the battle mount of Nargarak's trusted vassal and battle champion Jarl Carthugra. As white dragons share their preferred environments with frost giants, and since whites are among the meekest of the dragon kindreds, this arrangement is not uncommon. Jarl Nargarak's great rival, Jarl Grungenir of Holvirgang, also has a number of white dragons in his service. More details can be found on him in my Irisen deep dive video. There are, of course, many whites who have not succumbed to frost giant rule in this area and many large and dangerous whites actually prey on the frost giants, bravely threatening even the mighty frost giant holdfasts of the Jarls. One such famous white is Lydek of Mount Thraharak of the Tusks. Such is Lydek's influence over this area that several migratory and nomadic travel routes had to shift to avoid passing near Mount Thraharak, despite the fact that historically many low valleys around her mountain had served as vital crossing points in the Tusks for various of the Mammoth Lord followings. It is rumored that the famous Kellid trader Holg Tuskrider always travels with an Ilvarani spotter, specifically to look out for Lydek whenever he is in the tusks. Zyovor is an ancient white dragon who claimed the deep-run crevasse of northern Iobaria as his domain. He is reputedly the eldest and strongest dragon to survive Iobaria's Drake Plague, which swept through the mountains of the land in 4519. More details on this can be found in my Northeast Avistan deep dive video. Siovor is so ancient that unlike many whites, he is not disrespected by other true dragons, but rightly recognized as a fearsome and ancient creature. Siovor has even made himself ruler of a small kingdom there, called Ziovonor, and he claims numerous humans, orcs, harpies, and centaurs as his servants in that land. Green Dragons Green dragons are fallen brass dragons, and while brass dragons are the most whimsical of all the dragons, green dragons are paradoxically the opposite. They are self-serious dragons, who strive for self-perfection and constantly work to improve themselves. Despite emerging quite different from their forebears after their resurrection by Tiamat, most draconic scholars universally agree that greens are the most reasonable and pragmatic of the chromatic dragons, and in fact any successful attempt to reach some form of agreement between two draconic sets typically involve a green dragon as a mediator. When approached correctly, which generally means not when they are in meditation or asleep, Green dragons are the chromatics most often willing to converse with uninvited guests. Despite their reasonable personalities and openness to visitation, however, green dragons remain mostly evil, selfish creatures, and those fools who forget this tend to wind up as snacks. Among the chromatic dragons, it is the greens who hold a distinct appreciation for academia. They fill their lairs with an impressive collection of books and scrolls, despite their perceived disdain for lesser races. Greens do, in fact, reluctantly acknowledge the industrious humans for their role in documenting knowledge in a convenient and portable format. Acting as the scholarly and arcane practitioners among chromatics, green dragons have made significant contributions to fields such as mathematics, astronomy, and other varied fields. The defining physical feature of a green dragon is the single massive horn that protrudes from its snout, creating the most visually striking and easily recognizable head shape among true dragons. Each green dragon possesses a unique nose horn, which continues to grow throughout its entire lifespan. Another unique thing about green dragons is that they do not possess the same breath weapon as their progenitor. Where brass dragons breathe superheated plasma, green dragons exhale a corrosive torrent of gas, of similar hue and color to brass dragons, but it eats through material like acid rather than ignites, and it does not generate heat. Green dragons prefer to dwell in forests, specifically in the heart of ancient woods near groves of venerable trees. 
While they are inclined to live in caves, many settle for natural cairns or burial mounds, as well as stone-lined and covered pits dug by unwilling neighbours. When they opt for caves or caverns, green dragons take pleasure in concealing the entrances to their abodes with thick foliage, including bushes, vines, and other lush vegetation. With their corrosive breath, green dragons possess the ability to slowly dissolve solid stone, allowing them to delve into hillsides or create hollows within clusters of stones. However, they never employ their acidic exhalations on trees or plant matter, relying instead on magic to construct layers high up in the trees. Some particularly younger and smaller individuals, in fact, reside within the lofty branches of massive and ancient trees. In the Mwangi Expanse, the treetop layers of the oldest green dragons can span the collective length of more than two dozen colossal trees, with the upper reaches of these trees bowing under the weight of the dragon. These expansive layers, ingeniously constructed using interwoven ropes, chains, cables, and vines, are engineered by the dragons to withstand loads far exceeding their own weight. Such arrangements enable the greens to house at least a portion of their hordes within their elevated arboreal dwellings. As the forest-dwelling chromatic dragons, greens have a deep affinity for the natural world, and take pleasure in the artistry of wooden craftsmanship. They find delight in intricately carved wooden sculptures and ornate wooden furniture. Many green dragons amass collections of wooden canes, clubs, and staves, crafted from exquisite woods like oak, imbuing their hordes with a significant number of these magically enhanced items. However, the appreciation of greens extends beyond worked and enchanted woods. Those residing in proximity to coastlines often gather driftwood with peculiar shapes and colors, a practice that perplexes would-be thieves expecting only valuable treasures. This unexpected inclusion of unconventional items adds an element of confusion and surprise to the hordes of green dragons. Another defining feature of green dragon hordes is the presence of extensive libraries comprising books and scrolls. These collections typically feature advanced works on mathematics, numerology, and other subjects that captivates the specific dragon's interests. Within these archives, one can find unique manuscripts passed down through generations of masters and apprentices, or even written by the dragons themselves. Unscrupulous scholars, mathematicians, and arcane researchers often resort to desperate measures, offering bounties for the death of green dragons solely to gain access to these rare documents. While they share the common dragon fascination with coins, greens have a preference for copper and silver rather than gold or platinum. As scholars, they have a particular fondness for ancient coins from extinct nations, often possessing a higher collector's value than their face worth. Green dragons also take pleasure in vibrant gemstones like emeralds and peridot, which mirror the hues of their own scales. Green Dragons of Renown One of the most famous green dragons, Tassathil, has gained widespread recognition within Andoran for periodically challenging the great red emperor Daralathixil on his occasional rampages through the northern lands. Having arrived in the Arthfell Forest around the year 3300, Tassathil has engaged in at least nine documented battles with the so-called Sixth King. Each confrontation commences in the skies, but eventually descends to the ground, leaving destruction in their wake. On two occasions, these clashes have spilled over the inhabited areas, resulting in the destruction of homes and the unfortunate loss of numerous bystanders. Despite the collateral damage, it is appreciated by the humans of the region that she actually stands up to him, unlike the cowardly copper Wataxashil, the dragon of the town of Olfden. When she's not preoccupied with seeking new ways to vanquish her most despised opponent, Tassathil possesses an insatiable hunger for knowledge and information. She frequently hires explorers and adventurers to scour the nearby dwarven ruins on her behalf. Another green dragon of incredible renown is Zedarus, the great worm of the northern Fangwood. Over a millennium ago, a green dragon named Zedarin staked its claim in the northern Fangwood, despite the rule of the formidable lich known as the Whispering Tyrant over the region. At the time, Zedarin was still a young dragon and posed little threat to the powerful Lich King. Although Zedarin and Tarbafon never engaged in direct communication, they shared a common belief that humanoids were either meant to be enslaved or preyed upon. Their motives rarely clashed, and they managed to coexist in an uneasy peace for centuries. When the Shining Crusade defeated and imprisoned the Lich King, Zedarin found himself in a prime position to inherit any surviving orc servants following the Crusader's final assault on Gallowspire. He cemented the loyalty of the scattered orc tribes remaining in the northern Fangwood, who continued to provide him with a steady stream of tribute in exchange for the dragon's assistance in concealing their presence. Nestled within the depths of the Fangwood, listening to fragments of news from the outside world, and furthering his own studies and experiments, Zedaran bided his time in the shadows, while the Crusaders established the nation of Lastwall around him. Most recently in the region, Tarbafon has returned to Galarian and he has turned the nation of Lastwall into the Gravelands. Zedares is no longer the young wormling he was when Tarbafon first ruled in this realm. 
and it is likely Zedarus no longer considers the Whispering Tyrant to be a kindred spirit as he once did. Instead, Tarbophon is likely viewed as a challenger to his power in the region, and as the orcs of the region have galvanized against the Tyrant and the Living Dead this time around, and as the dead do not make great servants for Zedaras, it's entirely possible the Great Green Dragon will be a major player in future conflicts in a way he was not during the Tyrant's previous reign. Two more dragons of note are worth discussing, the green dragon Gartharis and his daughter Athervox. Gartharis of the Talden Borderwood gained fame for his scientific achievements. Within his modest woodland observatory, he observed and identified the planets of Triaxis and Aposte in the night sky. Although some human astronomers did attempt to take credit for this discovery, Gartharis's retribution was swift and absolute, a lesson learned for all humans who would try to take credit for the wisdom of the Greens. Despite his vast intellect and contributions to science and astrology, Gartharis still fell to the madness during the Talden Dragon Plague of the mid-3000s and was put down along with many of his kin. Gartharis was survived by his daughter Athervox. In her early years, Athervox found herself laboring diligently in the formidable shadow of her sire's previous discoveries. However, upon his demise a millennia ago, Athervox inherited his mundane and magical astronomical equipment. Armed with this wealth of knowledge and tools, she established an observatory near Sonara in the Whisperwoods of Cheliax. With the ascension of the hell-backed House of Thrun, Athervox perceived an opportunity to secure some measure of assurance from the human authorities to allow her to pursue her studies undisturbed. In exchange for privacy, the government in Agorian demanded that Athervox train a select group of human astronomers loyal to House Thrun. After a few years of training, the humans abruptly vanished one night, absconding with several volumes of Athervox's notes concerning astronomical connections to the realms of existence. To this day, she has not yet retaliated for the theft, but the House of Thrun would do well to remember that just because the dragon has not yet exacted vengeance for their insolence does not mean she has forgotten. Black Dragons I had previously described white dragons as those who had possibly suffered the most at the hands of Dahak's corruption, being the most reduced in terms of mental faculties and raw power, However, in terms of the effects Dahak's corruption had on the personality of the dragon, it was the black dragons that suffered the most. Sociopaths and murderers of the worst sort, black dragons terrorize their territories with a fury few other dragons bother to muster. Black dragons are cruel for cruelty's sake and make sport of their victims. Black dragons are corrupted bronze dragons, but they favor swamps instead of lakes, oceans, and seas. Like bronze dragons, they emit a blast of liquid acid as their breath weapon, but instead of a colorless slurry, the black dragon's toxic miasma is a black spray of corrosive tar-like fluid. Black dragons are easily identifiable by their distinctive large curving horns protruding from the sides of their skulls, just behind their jaws. These imposing horns give them a recognizable silhouette. Many black dragons possess numerous smaller horns and hornlets adorning their heads and faces, while a select few only develop their two primary horns without additional adornments. Some black dragons intentionally crack or break their horns, enduring considerable pain to allow the sharp protrusions to heal at jagged and unnatural angles. Black dragons typically have shorter necks and tails compared to other dragons, along with thick and muscular bodies. Their toes are often connected by a thick membrane of webbed skin, aiding them in gliding through the brackish waters of their habitats. While black dragons thrive in the perpetually damp morasses, they move away from their swampy dwellings when it comes to sleeping, preferring to seek dry lairs to rest. Within their muddy and murky abodes, black dragons assert unrivaled dominance. They reign supreme and brook no contest, as even the few swamp-dwelling creatures capable of challenging them wisely choose not to provoke their wrath. Engaging in battle with the black dragons is often a costly endeavor, as their acidic breath leaves permanent scars on their enemies, and their sadistic ingenuity continually devises new and cruel methods to inflict pain and suffering upon those who dare to oppose them. Black dragons are also natural slavers. They consider swamp-dwelling humanoids, such as lizardfolk and bogards, to be slaves and servants, and always treat them as such, commanding them to tasks they consider too menial to handle themselves. To black dragons, captive humans and elves, as well as other intelligent humanoid creatures of similar size, are considered treasures, with Asimars in particular making for especially prized captives. And they chain them up and put them on display, occasionally having them perform for their amusement. Black dragons also have a peculiar affinity for stone statues and cut crystals. However, they may deface or vandalize works that they find too aesthetically pleasing. As for crystals, black dragons prioritize quantity over quality and size over value. They are more attractive to massive quartz crystals that span several feet in length rather than flawless but minuscule diamonds. 
In fact, the stone and crystal collections of the oldest black dragons can rival those of the most esteemed princes of the elemental plane of Earth. Black Dragons of Renown Although it is the largest swamp in Avistan, historically, relatively few black dragons lived in the Mushfens, a swamp whose name makes most black dragons nervous. Racial history among their kind recalls that long ago, the humans of the area discovered ways to control and pacify their unfortunate ancestors. This is true, of course. For centuries, black dragons served the humans of Thassalon as guardians, pets, or worst of all, heavy laborers. Since the resurrection of the rune lord Sorshin and Bellamarius, it is rumored some ancient dragons have returned to the Mushfens, perhaps out of some magical compulsion or even misplaced loyalty to their progenitor's former masters. Among the most famous black dragons is Cerizilian, whose fearsome presence looms over the small swamp located to the north of Karkow in northeastern Ustalav, casting a shadow of terror upon the inhabitants of the region. In the heart of the swamp, she is worshipped as a goddess by a Kelid tribe and a trio of green hags, under the name the Mother of Fangs. However, deep down, she is aware that she is not herself the Mother of Fangs, the dark god worshipped by the original members of the Black Earth clan of Kelids. Despite her persistent attempts to make contact or summon this unknown entity, all her efforts have thus far been in vain. Frustration mounts with each failed endeavor, causing her to unleash her anger upon the bewildered and beleaguered neighbors, who remain unwitting victims caught in the crossfire. Finally, Ilthuliak is an old black dragon who makes her home in the Thousand Voices woods, just south of the Branthlin Mountains, and is notorious for raiding the River Kingdoms Numeria and Brevoy. During the events of the Kingmaker Adventure Path, she joined forces with the nymph queen Nerissa in exchange for promises of power and wealth. When heroes banded together to make a kingdom out of the stolen lands, they came into conflict with her, though her ultimate fate today remains unknown. Blue Dragons Blue dragons are corrupted copper dragons, possessing the same lightning breath. However, where coppers are among the meekest of the metallic dragons, uniquely in the case of the blues, the corruption of Dahak effectively heightened their powers, making them typically larger and more deadly than their metallic cousins. Blues are in fact considered the second most deadly chromatic form after the mighty reds. Also, unlike coppers, they don't tend to dwell in dry woodlands, but instead prefer drier desert climates, often competing for territories with brass dragons. Many blues, in fact, possess the ability to sand tunnel, allowing them to burrow rapidly through sand dunes and even rougher earth. Blue dragons are psychographically unique as well, and possess an innate need for order and precision, exhibiting neurotic tendencies towards tidiness, neatness, and carefulness in almost all aspects of their lives. This compulsion for control begins from the moment of their hatching and extends beyond external forces encompassing their own actions, thoughts, and even their emotions. Unlike their green counterparts who have a natural inclination for discipline, blue dragons struggle with self-control. However, they relish the exhilarating challenge of micromanaging and eradicating this deficiency. So often, instead of succumbing to self-destructive rampages when they reach their breaking point, blue dragons seethe in their thrones and mobilize their armies. In Kadira's language, the saber-rattling that precedes the outbreak of a full-fledged war is known as Aldraaksu, meaning the waking of the dragon. This phrase reflects the belief that most desert wars are instigated by blue dragons who desire their occurrence. In line with their burrowing nature, blue dragons have sleek and muscular bodies adorned with small, tightly overlapping scales. Their short claws are well suited for digging, while their swept-back horns and sparse cheek hornlets contribute to their swift and agile appearance. Even when at rest, they give the impression of constant motion. The leading edges of their wings are protected by thick scales, guarding the delicate wing membranes from stones while burrowing in the sand. Unlike many other dragon species, blues have the ability to fold their wings tightly against their sides, preventing them from hindering their movement through the sand. Blue dragons predominantly make their homes on the fringes of scorching arid deserts, favoring locations near crossroads, oases, way stations, or any areas frequented by humans. They seek to gain control over these critical sites, typically employing intermediaries to assert their dominance and influence over the creatures reliant on these areas. In keeping with their draconic nature, blue dragons prefer to dwell in dry caves, which are often found amidst the badlands, hills, or rugged rock formations that serve as natural boundaries to their desert domains. It is not uncommon for blue dragons to take up residence in the abandoned lairs of brass dragons, having driven off or slain the previous occupants to claim the territory as their own. Among all chromatic dragons, blue dragons derive the greatest pleasure from meddling in human politics. When they are not dwelling in the desert itself, they have a preference, in fact, for establishing their lairs openly, within the heart of a city, taking the form of a temple, fortress, or other sizable, privately owned structure, typically under the ownership of a trusted lieutenant. 
Beneath this legitimate and functional facade, an intricate network of hidden passages and tunnels snakes its way, serving sinister purposes such as housing an assassin's guild indirectly controlled by the dragon. These covert tunnels ultimately lead to expansive natural caverns that the dragon calls its home, either physically located beneath or situated at a distance from the surface. Blue dragons spend much of their wealth on the growth and decoration of their lairs, from gilded domes to exquisite marble statuary. Blue dragons must keep much of their wealth in the form of easily transportable currency, such as platinum coins or even minted gold or platinum bars, which they keep separate from the rest of their hordes for ease of access, to bribe bureaucrats and buy loyalty without having to access their most private chambers when hosting guests. Yet still, the coin beds of blue dragons are usually far larger than those of other dragons. Because of their cunning and focus, it typically makes them among the richest of all dragon varietals. Blue Dragons of Renown the most famous blue dragon of all is probably Kazavon, the dragon overlord of a kingdom in central Belkzen and western Ustalav, whose rise to power I document in more detail in my Ustalav deep dive video. Kazavon took the form of a human warlord, conquered a vast territory, and was ultimately slain by a brave and heroic knight of Lastwall. His power was so great that after he was killed, his bones were scattered to the four corners of the earth to prevent his resurrection. Kazavon's fangs were interred deep below Castle Corvosa, and it was the magic in these ancient fangs that eventually corrupted and inspired Queen Iliosa of Corvosa to become the cruel monarch she became. This, in turn, led to the events of the Curse of the Crimson Throne adventure path. Loralis, the Great Blue of Pashau, one of the five allied city-states of Thuvia, is a figure shrouded in myth and disbelief. She is often dismissed as a mere tale to frighten children, this widespread denial allows her to operate in relative peace, free from the fear of retaliation from those who might seek vengeance against her. Concealed within a meticulously designed vault of crafted stone, Loralis orchestrates an expanding network of intrigues and unwitting servants. Each day her trusted lieutenants report directly to her in the grand chamber hidden deep beneath the city. Although Emir Guldis is the hereditary human ruler of Pashau and is not in her pocket directly, he is definitely influenced by her. Through her capable and trusted lieutenants, she has significant control over many of the power centers in the city, including the Temple of Abadar and the City Watch. If Emir Guldis knows of her explicitly, then it is likely he treads carefully where she is concerned, because even the emirs of the great cities of Thuvia are careful when an ancient chromatic takes an interest in the affairs of their city-state. Unless one were to possess extraordinary luck or skill, infiltrating Loralis's lair without her knowledge or that of her agents would be virtually impossible. Within her seat of power, she remains perpetually vigilant, rendering any attempt to catch her off guard a formidable challenge. There is another famous blue in Thuvia as well, just south of Pashau in the Barrier Mountains. The great worm Deru Brujan's fascination lies in the acquisition of power. She understands that secrets serve as a potent tool for control and knowledge. Unlike material possessions or territory, it does not require constant upkeep once obtained. Secrets are commodities that can be wielded over the heads of the influential, granting the leverage needed to achieve great feats. In recent years, her focus has been on exerting influence over Thuvia's most sacred tradition, the auction of the Sun Orchid Elixir, a powerful alchemical concoction that confers immortality to the imbiber, which is almost impossible to produce and is auctioned off in small numbers once a year. Her lair, known as the Hidden Nest, operates as a veritable factory that produces a wide array of alchemical marvels, ranging from curatives and potions to drugs and poisons. These concoctions find their way to various corners of the inner sea, extending far beyond the sands of northern Garand. De Rubrujan's cabal employs numerous laborers who brave the scorching desert in search of sun orchids, essential for the alchemist's experiments. De Rubrujan's penchant for manipulation and her relentless pursuit of the Sun Orchid Elixir have pitted her against the authorities of Thuvia and all those seeking to acquire the Elixir legitimately through the auction. In recent years, in fact, two shipments of Sun Orchid Elixirs have been disrupted in Pashau. Those who traffic in secret truths have learned the blue dragon Loralis was not involved, and that in fact her agents worked tirelessly to uncover the identity of the thief. If it turns out De Rubrujan was involved, the two blue dragons may soon find themselves at odds, and woe be unto any who dare stand between them. Outer Dragons There is a final group of dragons who make their homes on the material plane, and they are called the Outer Dragons. As they are relatively rare, I will cover them rapidly here as well. Lunar dragons can be found on small asteroids and moons all across the void of space. 
and a number of them are said to layer on Galarian's moon as well. As they are relatively close to Galarian, these dragons are the most involved of all the outer dragons in Galarian's affairs. Lunar dragons have gossamer wings and spiny protrusions sweeping back from their face. Swirling cosmic patterns appear to be scattered across their scales. A lunar dragon's breath is so extremely cold that even creatures immune to the coldest temperatures can still experience harm from it, and it reflects light and other rays of energy as well. Solar dragons can travel a vacuum of space and are known to layer in stars. Just as with lunar dragons, a number of solar dragons can be found in Galarian solar system as well, inhabiting the sun, though they do not tend to involve themselves in many of Galarian's affairs. Solar dragons are such alien creatures that others are often blinded in their presence. Ancient solar dragons have the remarkable ability to rapidly cross the vast gulf of space in the universe by becoming light and traveling as a beam. They can also channel positive energy as both a healing force or as destructive radiation. Their breath is so hot that even creatures immune to extreme heat might experience harm if exposed to it. Legends claim that the Glory's Flame Lighthouse of Moot in Taldor, whose light has never gone out in more than three millennia, is illuminated by the beating heart of a solar dragon. Time dragons do dwell on the material plane, but they also intermittently can be found in the dimension of time, and are among the few creatures in the multiverse with accurate knowledge of its functioning, and the eldest of their kind are capable of moving backwards and forwards in time. That being said, there is something about the nature of the Age of Lost Omens, with its long drawn out periods of broken prophecy and unpredictable fates, that make it anathema to most temporal travellers. Time dragons will only come to this specific time in cases of great urgency, because they may risk being trapped here. Void dragons are outer dragons that are born and dwell in the darkness between spaces. Like other creatures that dwell in the endless dark, many have been tainted by long exposure to the terrible alien entities and embrace the encroaching void, existing only to feed and destroy. However, some void dragons continue to struggle against the inevitable tide of annihilation and become rare bastions of order, fighting against the entropic forces of the outer dark. Vortex dragons emerge from black holes and wormholes, and their mastery of folding space-time as a means of travel makes them the most efficient travelers of the universal void than any other creature in all of creation. Even the light-speed travel of solar dragons pales in comparison to the near-instantaneous wormhole travel of the vortex dragons. Vortex dragons are so strange that instead of a breath weapon, they can instead inhale creatures, turning their mouths into miniature black holes to draw them in. Because of their unique ability to jump between points in space, they often serve powerful entity as couriers. Most notably, the vortex dragon Entropidus serves as the chief messenger for the postal service of the plane of Axis and delivers messages all across the multiverse. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that video had all the good stuff that you are looking for. I hope you know more about dragons now than ever before. If you like this content, please be sure to like and subscribe. If there's other creatures that you'd like to hear about in my Creature Feature series, please let me know in the comments below. I read all the comments. And finally, I just want to call out that I have created a membership club here on YouTube. You can join it by clicking the join button right over here. It gives you early access to videos. So if you want to support the channel, please go over there. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week.